Hello. How are we? Is that it? How are we, Doncaster? Good. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's weird when you do things like this because obviously, because I have a, a massive ego, then you've all sort of seen me pottering around for about the last hour, but I have to go off stage when I walk on that you applaud me just to make me feel kind of good, just, just so you're aware of my fragile ego. Uh, it's nice to be here. This is my first time at Doncaster. Um, as many people say, I've changed trains at Doncaster, um, but, I've, but I've never been here before, so it's nice to be in the town. Stayed at the Mount Pleasant last night. Anyone stayed there? There's a few people sort of pretending they haven't. Um, it was very nice. They looked after us. It was cracking. Uh, be good today. Your wall market looks good. Food festival looks good. So has anybody done anything exciting so far? Anybody bought anything? You're all looking empty-handed so far. What have you bought? Sea bass. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, we got our monkfish from the fish market. So it's cracking. Well, we're going to cook um, three little dishes for you. Um, if you want to kind of ask me anything while I'm on, then, then feel free. Uh, so we're starting off with um, a mushroom dish with some gnocchi. So gnocchi is one of those things that if you, your only experience of it is those horrible little plastic bags of it that you buy in the supermarket that are like wallpaper paste, then you will have had a bad experience with it. But to make it yourself um, is quite a simple thing to do and incredibly tasty. But before that, we'll get the mushrooms and the onion on the go. So this is about getting some good flavour. Loads of kind of movement towards more and more kind of veggie food these days. And mushrooms are a great thing if you kind of, if you want to eat more veggie food, because you can get pack loads and loads of flavour into it. And we're going to use a bit of miso paste. So miso is a really great ingredient. It's very salty. It has that, what we call that umami about it. So it's that sort of fourth flavour that gives some really nice additional depth into it. And just a little bit of oil in the pan. Stick in our onion that we've finely diced. And you want to cook this slowly. I'm going to cook this way too quickly, really. Um, the thing is with an onion, so many dishes start with an onion. And then when you cook them, probably what you do at home, you do what most people do, where you'll kind of get the pan nice and hot, stick the onion in, fry it, and then everything else. Is that about right? Is that what you do? Well, that looks nice. What are you drinking? Oh, nice. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm just checking the time. Half 12. It's fine. It's a Saturday. Is that your first? <laughs> Is it your second? Are you third? third? Fourth? First? So far. Um, the thing is, so when you cook an onion, what you want to do, onion has loads and loads of sugar in it, natural sugars. So if you slow down that cooking process and you get the onion to, to slow it down, say if you're making some like your spaghetti bolognese, if you just slow down that cooking process, then you release loads of that natural sugar. And when you release those sugars, it gives you a depth of flavour. So if you cook a spag bol, it means that the flavour you start with is deeper than if you're just going to fry it. It's just a, a little tip. It kind of works. You're, you're underwhelmed by that, I can sense. So we cook this off. So we start the gnocchi. So the mushrooms will go a little while once we've kind of got the onions cooking down um, a little bit. Now, the gnocchi is very simple. It's a potato pasta, in effect. So what we do is we have a load of potato, and then in the centre of the potato, we crack in an egg. Now, when I've mashed the potato, I've just got the potato, I've cooked it, and then just let it sit. Don't refresh it, don't put any extra water on it. You want it to stay dry-ish. So in goes the egg, plenty of salt, plenty of pepper, because obviously the potato will suck the lifeblood out of all the seasoning. You know, you sort of think when you have chips, then you, you want loads of salt in to get that, that good flavour. So you mix that around, and then we add into that, we add our flour. And what we're looking for is for this to turn into, into a dough, in effect. So you add most of the flour into it and just start mixing it together. You don't want to overwork this, but you want it to all be combined. And what will happen with this is you want it to be moist, but you don't want it to be too sticky and you don't want it to be too dry. And when you make gnocchi, then it always changes depending on the weather. Because what happens is the flour responds differently to the atmosphere. So when it's a damp day, and it's a quite a damp day today, sometimes you need a little bit more flour because the flour will absorb moisture. If it's a really dry day, you'll probably need a little bit less. The same when you're making a cake. We're not talking like loads of difference, just a little bit. And you work this and work this and work this so all this comes together like I say, almost like you've got, like, got a dough, you've got like, like modelling clay kind of thing. And if this is perfect, then what should happen is that when I put it on my palm, 
then it should feel nice and moist, but it shouldn't feel sticky. And it shouldn't leave any residue. Perfect. I'm a genius. What can I say? So, so we let that sit. And then, whilst that does, then our onions are now cooking. As I say, I'm cooking these too fast. You know, you're going to take 15, 20 minutes to, to do this. And then you chuck into the pan, chuck in the mushrooms. I'm just using chestnut mushrooms. They go into there and let them cook out. Okay? And you've got the onion in there and the mushrooms. What you want to do, you want to let the mushrooms sit there. I give them a little shake because I've got onions in there. Uh, but what you want to do is just let them sit because what you have, the mushrooms have got loads of water in them. And to get the flavour, you know when you go to a, a greasy spoon and you get a breakfast and the mushrooms are slimy. You know what I mean? I, it, I hate that. It makes me, makes me gag. It's horrible. And when I come to your house for breakfast tomorrow, actually no, I'll be in London next week. Are you cooking breakfast for me? Yeah. So what I want is, so when you cut the mushrooms, it's just let them sit in the pan, on a really, really hot pan, because then all of the moisture will evaporate and you'll get like a nice kind of crispy edge to it. So back to our gnocchi, what we have with the gnocchi. We now have this dough, and we're just going to roll this out. A little bit of flour on the board, and then you just get our potato, and keep working it, keep working it, keep working it, and then we'll start rolling it out. So you want to make it into a bit of a sausage shape, and then start rolling it. And up to this point, I've tried to do all of it with one hand. And the reason for that is, you know yourself, if you're kind of cooking something, then one or two things happen. When you, when you make something, you always forget an ingredient, so you're going back to your cupboard. But the other thing that happens all the time, of course, is that your phone rings. So if you get in that habit of cooking with one hand when you mix anything, it will make your life easier. So we have this lovely, simple, little line of gnocchi and then we just cut it into pieces about that size. Now gnocchi, because I said it's a potato pasta, then you want it to absorb as much flavour and as much moisture as you can from the dish that you're doing. Now the way that we kind of do it in the restaurant is you put a little bit of flour on your fork and you'll turn the gnocchi on its side and just press it down like that. So you know when you get like a pasta, when you get something like a penne, when you've got all those little lines in it, it's that same principle. So you just get, that will suck up all the sauce that you're going to make, all right? So a bit of that, a bit of that, a bit of that. And it's one of those things that in, in the restaurants, then when you kind of get the junior chefs to kind of do it, and they're making a batch of kind of four and a half kilos of gnocchi, then it's, it's a very, very laborious job. But it's nice to do it on that cut end, because that's the way that it's going to work so much better, all right? So, once that's done, then we put this into boiling water. Make sure the water's boiling, make sure there's plenty of salt in it, make sure that you've got lots and lots of the water. Same when you're cooking pasta. You don't want the pasta to be in a small pan of water. It needs to be loads. It's what we call a rolling boil, and you want far more water than you would ever imagine. And the reason for that is that you want it to cook evenly. If you have it too tight, then it's when it all sticks. You know, when you put your pasta in the pan and it doesn't kind of do enough, it's that whole thing. You, you, you want to change that. Right, so our mushrooms are cooking away. And we want to now add some more flavour into our mushrooms. Again, I'm, I'm cooking this way too fast. You know, you're going to cook this so much more slowly. When you go home tonight and you cook this, which of course you'll do, then you'll just slow it down a little bit. So assuming that our mushrooms are cooked for about seven, eight minutes or so, we add into there a little splash of soy sauce into there. And we'll crank up that heat. So that's going to give us a little bit of saltiness. We then add a little bit of sake into there, and again, reduce that down. You have to use this, the kind of the rice wine is kind of, it's not crucial, but it cooks down beautifully and gives some really, really nice flavour. We then add a little bit of our miso paste. So that goes onto there, and this will give us some really nice depth of flavour into the pan. And you don't need loads of it. Again, it's quite strong. It's quite a strong flavour. So just let it all cook out like so, okay? And that's starting to smell delicious. You've got all that kind of mushroomy flavour in there. And to cut through it, we add a little bit of vinegar, all right? So that then we've got sweet, we've got salty, and now we've got that lovely kind of bit of acidity that will work beautifully and cut that down. Now, Mother Nature is a wonderful thing. So what she does with our gnocchi, as the gnocchi rises to the surface, 
that means it's cooked. So the egg and the flour have now cooked out and all of the gnocchi rises to the surface. So we're going to fry this now to get yet more flavour. So as it comes up to the top, scoop it out straight into a nice hot pan. And again, like we did with the mushrooms before, you don't want to shake this around. You just want this to kind of sit there. You want to make sure that it's there so we get the gnocchi nice and crispy. So it's a fried potato in effect. You know, you sort of think how delicious chips are. Then it's a, it's a poncy version of doing that in effect, really. So that goes into there. I just let it sit. Let this water evaporate. Let that flavour come out. So I've just done the gnocchi um, with just um, egg and flour. You could add other flavour into it if you wanted. You know, you could quite easily um, add a little bit of ricotta into it, add some spinach into it, some garlic, whatever you want. So as our gnocchi sits there, just be very, very patient with it, okay? You want to make sure that you've got some colour. Now, vinegar added into this may well have seemed like a slightly sort of weird thing to do. But the great thing about vinegar is it opens up your taste buds. If you were cooking something like, again, coming back to our spag bowl, which I always use a reference point. If you're cooking a spag bowl, and, or you're cooking a casserole, anything that's non-cream based. And if you come to the end of the cooking process and you think to yourself, it tastes a little bit bland. You know, we've all kind of been there when you're cooking something, you think it just needs something else. And what we all tend to do is you'll tend to add more ingredients into it. And it isn't necessarily ingredients that you need. What you quite often need is acidity. So a little teaspoon, genuinely a little teaspoon of vinegar, next time you make a bolognese, right at the end, will just open up the flavour. Does that make sense? You're all looking at me like I've said something you know, mental, lads. So, what we do, uh, in fact, the best way to describe it, right? So vinegar, well, your taste buds, right, work on either complementary or contrasting flavours. So a complementary flavour, i.e. something that goes with it, a contrasting flavour is something that doesn't. So fish and chips is the best example. So fish and chips, so fish is kind of quite, quite sweet in flavour. Chips, quite sweet in flavour. You've got that kind of, that, that match going on there. And then what we like as human beings, we like to add other things to it. So if you have um, a complementary flavour, then you'll add mushy peas to it, right? So you've got three sweet things there. But the thing that makes them exciting is if you add a contrasting flavour, OK? So we put vinegar on our chips, or we squeeze lemon on the fish, yeah? And you know what I mean? And that, that kind of makes it exciting. So the best way to, to analyse it. So last night, for example, so I checked in, I'd say, stayed in the Mount Pleasant last night. Stayed in the Mount Pleasant, it was very nice. It was great, it was really, really good. Quite often, I stay in a lot of hotels. So you could go into a hotel and to demonstrate complementary flavours. So you go into the hotel and it's got quite a nice reception area. The girl on reception, she's got a beige outfit on, she's got glasses on, she's got her hair tied up. She checks you in, she's very efficient, gives you the key, off you go, happy days. Contrasting flavours, when it gets excited, when we put the vinegar on our chips, we put the lemon on our fish, you go into the same hotel, it's the same girl. This time, however, you notice that behind her glasses, she's got really beautiful blue eyes. And she takes off the glasses. You think, wow, she's very attractive. As she does that, she catches the bubble in the back of her head and her hair falls down and she's got <laughs> beautiful, long, thick blonde hair. She shakes back. And then as she does that, she knocks a couple of buttons <laughs> that are undone on her outfit. And you notice that underneath that beige outfit, she's got a very attractive print push-up bra on. That's the difference between putting vinegar on your chips or not, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. You understand it more now, don't you? Right, so our mushrooms are now cooked. Our gnocchi, we now have a bit of butter, and that's got lovely foaming butter on there, and it's got a little bit crispy. We tip that in with our mushrooms, and we shake all of that together. And this has got great flavour. You've got the vinegar in there, so we know what that does to our taste buds. We shake all of that around. But there's one more little flavour that we're going to add into there. I've toasted some walnuts, and this is a really nice thing to do. When you eat walnuts, sometimes the aftertaste of walnuts can be um, a, a little bit um, acidic. You know, it can be a, a little bit kind of sharp. If you toast them, but not just toast them so they're sort of lightly roasted, really go for it so they're quite dark. They almost end up tasting like rye bread. So they have this lovely, deep, rich, slightly sweet flavour which works beautifully. And you get this lovely, lovely flavour that just gives us one extra dimension. And then to serve our first dish, we just spoon this lovely, now crispy, buttery, 
gnocchi onto the plate. And the walnuts are just that final little bit of flavour that works so well. And you can add as much or as little of things like the mirin um, and, the, uh, and the miso paste as you want. And just finish it with some beautiful little bits of lamb's lettuce on the top. So our first dish today, ladies and gentlemen, is our gnocchi with our chestnut mushroom. I thank you. All right, so. The, uh, the next thing we do, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of fish. Um, so we've got some beautiful monkfish um, from your magnificent local fish market um, yesterday. You. Whatever you're making, then chorizo just adds to it. And this is absolutely no exception. But what I like to do when I cook chorizo, I want it to be um, quite, a, quite a deep flavor. I want it to be crispy. I want to get some depth of flavor. This is Claire, by the way, my glamorous assistant. Um, so Claire is abandoning me. So Claire works on Sunday brunch. So um, if you think there's a dish that looks really good, it's because Claire's done a brilliant job. If you think that looks really rubbish, that's probably my idea. Um, but Claire is abandoning me. Uh, she's, she, Claire is running away with Gino De Campo for five weeks. Yeah. All right. All right, you've come to see me. When'd you go? Monday. She goes Monday. She's going to Italy for five weeks with Gino. Yeah. I'm happy to be in Doncaster, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I know where my bread's buttered. Right, so this dish. So what we do first of all, uh, our chorizo. Again, similar thing. A little bit of oil in the pan, get your pan nice and hot. And what we're going to have uh, in here is our chorizo. So the chorizo, loads of different kinds of chorizo. There's kind of cooking chorizo, there's spicy chorizo, whatever you want to do. Um, but what, what's crucial is that you make sure the pan is hot. It's a nice thing to do, just a very simple thing to do, if you're just gonna nibble a bit of chorizo, is if you fry it with a little bit of sherry. That works brilliantly, because you get some really nice deep flavor in there. So some nice slices of that, and make sure that, that pan and the oil is good and hot. And then once you're at that point, then we chuck it in the pan. And again, there's a theme here today, like we did with the mushrooms, like we did with the gnocchi. We're just gonna let it sit there. We're not gonna shake it around. What I want is for it to fry. So it goes in and sits there, because the base of this is gonna put all the flavor into the rest of the dish. So this will put flavor into our little barley risotto. It's gonna make it absolutely superb. Right, so monkfish. Monk, do we like monkfish? Do we eat a lot of monkfish? Right, monkfish is a great fish. It's an ugly fish, a monkfish. It's one of those fish that's kind of like got a massive big head. So it's kind of like that. And it's got like a big long tail, okay? And we tend to eat the tail. So the tail is very, very meaty. Uh, but what the tail has, it has this kind of grey membrane around it. And when you buy it from your fish monkeys, get them to take that membrane off. If they don't take the membrane off, when you cook it, it will kind of boom around a little bit. You know, almost like there's something too tight around it. So it's quite, tastes fine, but it just doesn't look as pretty. So make sure that that's taken off, all right? So what we do, we've got our little bits of monkfish and into our flour, we've had a little bit of salt and a little bit of paprika. And we just put in these little pieces of monkfish and put a little bit of flour on to crisp it up and to just add a little bit more flavor into it. And you can have as much of this as, as you want. If you can't get hold of monkfish, this dish works beautifully. It works with salmon, it works with cod. It works with any of the sort of like the, the, the bigger fish, if you like. It's, it's a really, really nice flavor. Now, back to our chorizo for a sec. What we've got, now that you can smell that, it's starting to kind of get this lovely and um, delicious paprika -y smell. It's starting to come out. We then, again, we do the same thing that we did before. A little bit of onion is going to go into there, but this time, we're just going to have some nice slices of onion in there. And again, what you would do in the real world when you go back home tomorrow, tonight rather, then um, you'll just slow the cooking process down. But we're not, we're just going to chuck it in. So in goes that onion. And straight away, when it goes in, because all of this lovely oil is starting to come out of the chorizo, that's starting to flavor it up, okay? Then we also add our little bit of garlic, goes into there, so we're getting some nice flavor onto that. That goes in, so we've got great flavor. It's, you know, always when you're cooking, you're looking at that kind of depth of flavor thing. You're looking at making sure that you're building flavors all the time. So we've got onion, we've got chorizo, we've got some nice sort of deep flavor going on in there, all right? So, did any of you see me when I did Strictly? The most terrifying thing I've ever done in my life. So I knew a few people who'd done it, and um, I, 
I always sort of said, I'm yeah, actually sure if you did watch it that I can't dance. Um, but everyone said, if you get the chance, don't miss out because it's a really great experience. And it was, it was, it was fantastic. But it's bloody terrifying, right? So, so you start off and you go in, you do all these kind of group dances, and that's, that's fine, you know, you kind of, you, you make a fool of yourself and that's it. But like the worst day that you have is the day when you do your, your first solo dance. So I was, I was dancing with Karen, who was brilliant, and has become like a, a proper close family friend. Um, and I was doing the Paso Doble. So you've practiced all week, and you know you're rubbish, and then you, you're there, you're in the studio. So never, ever having been, even when I was young, I, I wasn't somebody who sort of danced in clubs or anything. And, and you're there, and the first time that you're ever gonna dance is live on national television in front of 12 and a half million people. I mean, you stand, I'm standing I'm stand in a box, right? So it's the start of it, and I'm, and I'm, I'm standing there on this box. And they are dancing, the Paso Doble, Simon Rimmer and Carol Clifton. And at that moment, you genuinely can't hear anything. All you can hear is your heart literally pounding out of your chest. You can't hear the music, you can't remember everything you're going to do, you're not quite sure what your name is. And at that moment, you genuinely, if somebody come up to you and said, listen mate, you don't have to do this. Get your coat on, there's a taxi waiting for you outside. You go, you would take it, you would absolutely take it. It is the most terrifying thing ever. But it was, it was brilliant. I, I, I loved it. I, and I was very got first week. I managed to get to week six, um, which I'm kind of pretty chuffed with, really. Did anyone vote for me? Yeah, a few more of you buggers have voted. Maybe I would have lasted until <laughs> week seven. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, right, so back to this. So we have, we've got our lovely monkfish. So we put this in a little bit of seasoned flour again. We have a little bit of oil in the pan. You want the pan to be hot, but not like smokingly hot. Probably a little bit hot there, but it's fine. And pop that into there. These are little pieces of monkfish, don't take long. Shake off the excess flour. You don't want it to taste of flour. You want it to taste of fish. That goes into there. And then we want to get some aromatics going on in here. If you've got big pieces of monkfish, you can actually skewer them onto the rosemary. But we're just going to put it in, and you get this lovely flavour. Rosemary is one of those great herbs. It's very heady. It's a really, really delicious, delicious herb. I'm going to zest a little bit of lemon onto the top to start with, just to put some lightness of colour in there. You never want to put any um, juice in at this stage, because it will just burn. And this won't take very long at all um, to get it cooking. So once you get to the point where you can see that it's starting to get a little bit of colour on it, just flip it over, that's nice. Lovely. See, it doesn't take very long at all. It, it is that kind of ultimate fast food thing. You know, fish is always a chef's favourite thing to cook. Once you've got to that point, then what we're going to do, we're going to add a dollop of butter into the pan. Give that a little bit of a shake around. I'm just going to pop it into the oven. Now, when you cook fish, fish is one of those things that we're all a little bit frightened of. We all seem to think that if you don't kind of take the fish straight out of the fridge, then put it straight into the pan, then what will happen is that it will kill us. In fact, what you want to do is you want to let it get up to room temperature before you cook it. And the reason for that is you sort of think, if, say if you, say a day like today, it's quite a cold day today. The worst thing you do when, when you've been on a day like this is you would never go home, run the hottest bath you can imagine, take your clothes off and jump in. Because you're going to do that, aren't you? That, that's what you do. So instead, you go home, you get inside, you put the telly on, you check your Facebook, you check Twitter, you get undressed, you look in the mirror and you go, I shouldn't have had that second donut when I went to that food festival today because my arse looks massive. <laughs> I've got to say, whenever I tell this story, I always make sure I glance into the mid-distance. <laughs> I learned very early on, never make eye contact with anybody when you, when you tell the story. And then, and then you slide yourself into the bath and everything is fine. And it's the same if you're cooking a piece of fish. If it's going from cold into hot, Straight away, the fish is going to do that. It's the same with a piece of meat. You want a piece of meat to go up to room temperature as well. You, you want it to get up to room temp, and that means the minute it goes into the pan, that it starts to cook rather than having to get up to room temperature. Okay? Right, so back to this. So we've got our onion, we've got our chorizo. We've got great smell coming out of that. We've got really, really nice colour. Then we're going to make a, a barley risotto. Now, you would make it in the same way if you do it in the, in the real world. What you do is you put the barley in raw, you then add a little bit of warm stock like you do with it with a normal rice risotto. Um, but for us, I've cooked this already, so I've just kind of I've just boiled the, the, um, the barley off. So you've got that really nice flavour. You've got some good, good flavour coming into that. And again, I've got some nice texture 
coming on that. Barley's a great thing. A little bit of stock goes into there and we let that bubble away. Then, next thing we have, coming back to our rosemary. So now we've got this lovely rosemary that's already in with the monkfish. So we're building up those layers of flavour, like we were saying before, uh, with the mushrooms. You want to make sure that they're all built up. That goes into there. And then we chop and we chop and we chop. And this is going to give us some really delicious, delicious flavour. And the rosemary and the chorizo and the monkfish combined, that's building up flavours on a dish that are just going to be heavenly. So the rosemary goes into there. Give that a little bit of a stir around. Now again, I chucked in a load of butter in with that monkfish. And I'm going to do exactly the same with this risotto because I want the flavour to be great. And butter is one of those great things that does it. If you, if you kind of worry about it, you can leave it out. But this is all about getting some good flavour in there. And I've added very, very little stock into this deliberately. I don't want the stock to kind of make it too, too wet. I'd rather get the butter and flavour in there than add it. Then we add a little handful of peas, goes into there. Good colour, good flavour, good texture, and they're good for you. So they come in and we give those a little bit of a stir around as well. Some really great colour. I mean, I could just eat that. I, mean, I, don't, I don't even need the monkfish with it. I could just eat that. You've got that lovely flavour of the chorizo, you've got the butter, you've got the peas, you've got the onion, you've got some good stuff going in there. Then, back to our lemon again. A little bit of lemon zest into there. So we're getting the oil from the lemon. The reason that you use the zest is because you've got all the oils that are sitting in there. And that will just lighten up these flavours. Because, of course, the chorizo is quite heavy, the rosemary is quite heavy. The lemon will give us a little bit more. So the monkfish, that went into the oven, and it doesn't take long at all. And what will happen is, of course, the butter is going to give us some more flavour into there, and also going to give us some really nice colour. And that's heavenly. And the great thing that's happened is, we've charred off all of this beautiful monkfish. And that simply sits on there. Now, if I was serving this at home, I'd serve it just like that, you know what I mean? I'd just kind of do it as a, as a massive big bowl, as a massive big pan full, rather than kind of do it as, a, as an individual serving. And right at the end, what we do, we just squeeze over a little bit of lemon juice now. This should go at the end. Always importantly, it's at the end. You want it to be fresh. If you put it in too early, then as it cooks, it becomes sour, which is a weird thing to say about lemon. But you know what I mean? That, sort of, that, that smell and flavour of burnt lemon is quite, quite unpleasant. And what we do to serve this rather lovely dish, we simply spoon some of this beautiful barley risotto with our chorizo and our rosemary and our garlic and these lovely little bits of monkfish. And you want all these lovely little charred bits of the chorizo everything that we want and equally you can see on that we've got some really nice little bits of charred rosemary and then just get a little bit of this chorizo oil and butter and dribble that over the top that's so nice so our second dish of the day is our monkfish with our barley risotto i thank you right It's, uh, it's, it's pudding time. Uh, final dish is what we're going to do. Um, and I, I don't do as many food festivals as I used to do, but they're always, always good fun to do. And sometimes you kind of go to, to places and, and the, the, the setup isn't kind of quite as it should be. Years ago, um, I did the first food festival in Chester. And you know, it's like you come to these things because it's the weekend, you've got a bit of time. A lot of them happen over bank holiday weekends. Chester City Council decided the first year, because Chester's quite a touristy town, that they could do a food festival like through the week. Um, and I was sort of, you know, new starting out, nobody really knew who I was. Um, so I got the 11.30 on a Thursday morning slot. So we're in a, in a room about this size. There's about like 10, 12 people in here. And there's this guy comes in. And say where the lady with that pink top there is. So he comes in. Bear in mind, we're at a food festival. But rather than him looking at the stage, he's kind of sitting like that, right? So he's come in and he's 
bought his own sandwiches with him. He's got his sandwiches wrapped in foil and he's got his flask. This is honestly a true story. So he sits there and he's kind of looking over his shoulder. I'm trying to kind of like, you know, entertain the, 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 the few people that are in there. And he opens up his sandwiches and he sits there and he eats his sandwiches and he drinks his coffee. Puts a little back on his coffee, screws up the foil, drops it on the floor, gets up, and walks out. Right. So I'm crestfallen. Now I'm there, I'm sort of like trying to, trying to kind of make my way, trying to do a few demos, trying to sort of get a little bit of work on the circuit. And um, this guy walks out and I thought, right, if ever I'm in a position where I've got like a good full room and somebody walks out, I'm going to heckle them, right, just to warn you. Um, so I'm telling this story at Southport Food Festival, at Southport Flower Show a couple of years back. So I'm telling this story, and it's, it's, a, it's a bigger room than this, and, it, and it's full. And this little old lady gets up, and she kind of goes to walk out. So like, here I go, I'm like, you know, I'm Mr. Clever, I'm Mr. Funny. I'll kind of like, you know, I'll have a bit of fun with her. So I said, um, was it something I said? And she goes, walk out. And she looks straight and said, everyone's going to look at this old lady. She goes, just stop finding it very interesting. <laughs> So if you do want to leave, now is probably a really good time. Now, now you're kind of armed with that knowledge. Right, so final dish, we're going to make a cake. Um, love making cakes. Um, and this is, a, this is a loaf. So rather than it being um, a, a fancy cake, it's something that you'd have with a brew in the afternoon. And we're doing it with butternut squash and with some dates. So what you need to do always when you make a cake is there are certain rules that you need to apply yourself to. One is that you need to get plenty of air into the cake. You want your cake to be light. The other thing is that you don't want to overwork the cake. If you overwork, particularly the flour, you know sometimes if you make a cake, I'm sure you've all done it, and it feels like the cake is quite heavy and it's quite dense, you know, so the, so the edges of it might be too compact. Almost like you've squashed it, but you actually haven't. It's because you overwork it. So it's important that you don't do that. So in terms of getting some volume into it, first of all, we have sugar and we have eggs and we whisk them. And I really want to kind of whisk this for about five minutes or so. I want to get that really sort of nice and light fluffy thing. Because what happens is you whisk the eggs and the sugar, then they begin to stabilise and the volume comes in. You get lots and lots of air into them. So that all kind of lifts up. And you can see it doesn't take long. This is, this is why sometimes you'll end up with a heavy cake. Because you'll get to that point, which is taken, what, 30 seconds. You think, yeah, that's fine. But this isn't particularly stable. At the moment, they're kind of separate. By whisking it, you start to stabilise the eggs and the sugar. Because I am getting bored now, I'll move on. But what you'll do when you go home today, once you've made the monkfish, in fact, you probably make this first so it can get cold. But make your cake first when you go home. Don't do, don't do the monkfish first, yeah? Um, so whisk this, and after five minutes, then we add some oil into this. And oil is a great thing that goes into cakes. Oil or sour cream, something that's kind of fatty and oily. Um, and that will keep the cake really, really nice and moist. Okay? And again, you've spent five minutes on the eggs and the sugar, then you'll spend another sort of two to three minutes with the oil. So all of that just works out quite beautifully. And it will, by this time, when you do it, your, your bowl will be up to there. Okay? That's what you're looking for. You're looking for that really kind of high volume on that. Right, so then what we do, we then, we then have our squash and our date. So the butternut squash, we've cut it into cubes and we've roasted it. And just give it a little bit of a mash. You can blend it if you want, but I quite like the texture. You know, you, it doesn't have to be silky smooth, this. It's a really nice thing, you know, if, you, if you've... If you remember if, when you had little kids, or if you have got little kids, that butternut squash is one of those great things that they'll like when they'll go into solids, because it's, it's got a really nice sweet flavour. And it's brilliant in a cake, it's brilliant in a muffin. It works really well in, in sweet desserts. So you give that a little bit of a mash, so that's done. Then, we have some pecan nuts. And the pecans are going to give us some good flavour. You could toast the pecans before when we were doing the walnuts and we toasted them so that they have a good flavour. You could do the same thing with these, but you don't need to because we're going to cook them out. Okay? And then, they go into there as well. And then, into here, we add baking powder, bicarb, cinnamon. And then we add our flour. So this is when I've stopped using the electric whisk now. I now want this to be done by hand, okay? And the reason for that is, 
we're talking at the start of this saying about like, you know, if you have kind of like um, a really sort of heavy cake, overworking it is everything you don't want. So when you add the flour onto this, you just want to fold it quite large, big swoops. You don't want to be fiddling around with it. The less you mess around with this flour, the better it's going to be. So you see, it's just big sweeps like that. And coming right the way around. And the minute that this is combined, you stop. And the reason I'm working like this is I'm not overworking that flour. If I start overworking the flour, then what happens is the cake gets heavy. So you're looking for literally the minute that that all comes together, you stop. And you're always trying to do the biggest movement that you can. It's why I don't really like making cakes in a machine because they work them too hard. That's beautiful. So that is just there. You can see that mix is just there. Stop. You don't need to give it an extra couple of goes for good luck. You really, really don't. We chuck into there all of this delicious butternut squash, our pecans and our dates go into there. And again, you want to do the same thing. You just want to make sure that that is mixed around. And then we chuck it into our loaf tin. You can't do it in a round. I just like it as a loaf. There's something very nice about it as a loaf cooked with a nice little bit of frosting on top. It's heavenly. So that cooks for around about 45 to 50 minutes. Now, do you do that thing? When you cook a cake, do you do that thing of you pull the cake out of the oven when, it, when the, you pull a little skewer out, it's completely dry. Is that what you do? Right. I'm going to change the world today. Um, I don't do that. I actually pull it out when there's still just a little bit of moisture on the bottom. So when it comes out, there's still a little bit sticky on the bottom. And the reason for that is that what you have when you cook something is you have loads of what we call residual heat. So rather than just, it doesn't stop. When you take that cake out of the oven, it doesn't stop cooking. It doesn't suddenly go freezing cold. And um, what you have is loads of heat already in there. So if you take your cake out when there's just like that much, so if you've got, you know, you've got your long skewer, if you've got just that much at the bottom that's still a little bit sticky, that will give you pretty much a perfect cake um, every time. Underwhelmed, aren't you? Right, so what we do, for our, for our frosting on the top, there we go, uh, we then are going to make a very, very simple bit of frosting, or icing, whatever you want to call it. And all that is, we have some cream cheese, and we have a little bit of sugar, and we have a little bit of vanilla. So, sugar goes on, the vanilla goes in, and you just whisk all of this together. And it doesn't take long, you don't want to over whisk it, because then it will go too, too soft. It's that easy, and again, you can add flavours into this if you want. Beautiful. And the flavour of that is lovely. Sugar, cream cheese, vanilla, that's all you need. So our cake, once that is cooked, thank you very much, uh, once that is cooked, we end up with it like that, okay? So it's lovely. I mean, you don't need the frost. So this is nice. You serve that warm, slice of that buttered is, is all that it needs to be. You know, the, the, the flavour is spot on. And then what we do, we get this beautiful bit of cream cheese, pop it on the top. Now, another little tip for you. When you're kind of doing things like this, you want to put it in the centre and work it out. And the reason I like to do that is so you try and avoid, you, you always get a little bit, you try and avoid unnecessary bits of crumb, okay? Because if you do it from the edge, you're more likely to break that cake. Whereas if you're sort of paddling it out from the centre, you're always pushing away. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? So rather than it kind of being close up and you're just kind of chucking it in, this way, you're kind of moving outwards. So you're less likely to get quite unattractive crumbs on there. And then you'd let this set, really. You let this sit for about sort of 15, 20 minutes or so. And you don't want it to be too even. You want it to look like you've had a bit of fun doing it. And then finally, we sit on the top. So more of our pecans that we've chopped. So you've got all that nutty flavour, but you've also got all of the delicious bits of squash on there. And then, when you slice into it, what we have 
is this lovely loaf. Oh, that's beautiful. This lovely loaf with the great bits of squash and the pecans in the centre. It's heavenly. Right, ladies and gents, so, uh, last dish. So what have we learned today? So we've learned about uh, gnocchi, how easy it is to do. We've learned um, the effect of putting vinegar on your chips. Um, we've learned that you need to make sure that your fish comes up to room temperature and we've cooked a rather lovely cake. Mm -hmm.